I am here with Whitney Tilson, who is probably, make that not probably, definitely, I think the world's foremost Berkshire Hathaway Warren Buffett expert. Do you agree with that, Whitney, first of all? Well, uh, there are a handful of us uh, who've obsessively studied Buffett and Munger over the years, but this is my 26th consecutive Berkshire Hathaway annual meeting, so uh, You're I'm certainly there, up there. You're up there, at least, certainly. Yeah. And, and let me give you a weird factoid from my personal life. My son, Benjamin, he's 14 now, but about five years ago, you graciously let my business translate some of your Berkshire videos that you made for the Chinese audience. And I was editing over and over, and I guess he heard the introduction to one of the videos over and over. So when he was about nine or 10, he used to walk around the house saying, Hi, I'm Whitney Tilson. Hi, I'm Whitney Tilson. Uh, so, <laughs> You've never told me that story. Yeah, That's a good one. I gave him the, the art of playing defense, by the way. It's a great book. Great. Uh, so Whitney, on, on Berkshire, we just finished up the 2023 meeting. Uh, a few things jump out at me. Uh, First, let me ask you about succession, because obviously the, the video today, they have a funny video at, this, at the top of the, the meeting. Right. It, it sort of made fun of these questions starting in 1994, going till now. Obviously, at some point it will really happen. And, you know, 92 and 99, it may be soon. Uh, there are some that feel, and I think a question was along these lines, that if, if Buffett's A shares convert to B shares, they, they, they get one ten thousandth of the same voting rights. Uh, a, do you feel there is a real activist risk, and B, I guess even separate from that, uh, you could argue that there's a certain magic to Berkshire, that if I'm an entrepreneur, I'll sell at a lower price to Berkshire because there's so many intangible benefits that come along with that. But everybody else, smart and capable as they are, they don't have the magic, the cachet of Buffett and Munger. Uh, what happens going forward? Because an investor right now is not buying the past, they're buying the future. Right, um, well, you asked, there are two very different questions. You're right, there. you're right, you kind of um, snuck them in is, together. Is, um, when uh, Buffett passes, um, his 30-odd percent stake in Berkshire will over a dozen years be given to charity, converted to B shares, mm -hmm. and that will leave Berkshire without a controlling shareholder. So the question then is, is could a Carl Icahn, Bill yeah, Ackman, yeah. Nelson Peltz, some activist come along and demand a breakup of the company that would supposedly unleash a lot of value? Um, it becomes certainly more possible, but I think the odds go from zero to 1% of that happening. In other words, it's extremely unlikely. Um, Berkshire shareholders will still retain the shareholder base um, um, that's very long-term oriented, I think would be very unlikely to go for that kind of plan. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, the second question, um, refresh my mind on the second question. Um, the, the magic of Berkshire, uh, yes, without warning, yes. Which is, is Berkshire Hathaway's intrinsic value um, impaired Here. going forward once Buffett leaves? He's the key guy. Munger is 99. Um, he'll probably realistically be out of the picture, sadly, um, yeah, within yeah. a couple years, let's say. Whereas Buffett may well be running it for five more years. I mean, if he lasts as long as Munger, that's seven more years, right? Um, and Munger is still mentally razor sharp. But, yeah, he is. Um, and the answer is yes, slightly. Mm -hmm. And for many of the reasons, um, Buffett is um, a, a superior acquirer of businesses in terms of the judgment of what to acquire and what to say no to. But also you are correct what you pointed out where entrepreneurs, there's a prestige of selling to Warren Buffett yep. that is not the same prestige as selling to Greg Abel. Um, <laughs> And so, you know, Berkshire might miss out on the occasional deal or might not get quite as good a price as Buffett can command. Um, I would actually argue an almost bigger factor is, is a large fraction of Berkshire's value is all the operating companies, wholly owned businesses, uh, all run by, call it 75 CEOs, all of whom are already wealthy, many of whom are past retirement age, and there's a mystique of working for Buffett, and Berkshire has had almost zero turnover among all the incredible managers of all those businesses. When Buffett passes, in the next few years, say one, two, three years after he passes, no matter how great a manager and supervisor Greg Abel is, I think many of those managers may decide to retire. That, you know, Buffett's now gone, the mystique of working for Buffett. And that means there's some turnover among the subsidiaries um, who might not be as effective running those businesses, right? So you might start to get more turnover among the subsidiaries that could impair their performance slightly. But I view all of this as, as today, I view Berkshire as valued. It's an 87 cent dollar, according to my mm -hmm, calculations. Mm -hmm. And that's no Buffett premium at all. Just the value of the operating businesses and the cash and stocks and so forth yep. is, is about, um, 
it, the, the stock today at about 500,000, intrinsic value is about 560 in that range. And what's so the multiple for that? that you're... I use an 11 pre-tax multiple yep, yep, yep. on the operating business, giving a little bit of credit for the insurance operations, and then just the investments per share. I mean, you just add those two numbers together. And, uh, and that's a methodology I believe Buffett uses. I, I don't know what exact multiple he uses, but the general methodology is one he's laid out in his annual letters over many decades. And it's been a very accurate predictor of Berkshire stock over the 20 years that I've been using this methodology. Generally speaking, Berkshire over the last 15 years has very closely tracked the S&P. If you want to do better than the S&P, you need to be buying Berkshire at times that it is trading at at least a 10%, if not a 20% discount mm -hmm, to intrinsic mm -hmm. value. Today it's at about a 13%. Close to that, yeah. So yep. my guess would be, put a gun to my head and say, how does Berkshire perform relative to the S&P over the next five years on a compounded annual basis? I would say two points better. So I think you have to go in with reasonable expectations. It's a fabulous retirement stock. If your choice is the S&P 500 index or Berkshire, I prefer Berkshire moderately today, um, but I wait. And there was a time after the COVID crash, Berkshire went down with the market. The market rallied hard. Berkshire only rallied a little bit. And it was at that point trading at a 20 to 25% discount. That's when I loaded up on Berkshire and Berkshire. And that's when the whole meme stock thing and Kathy Wood and yep, all yep. these crazy growth stocks <laughs> peaked and Berkshire was in the toilet. It sort of reminded me of early 2000 at the peak of the internet bubble. That if you loaded up at that point over the next year, Berkshire was up 50 percent, and the growth stocks were down 80 percent. Right, like that. And was, you were banging that drum. I remember that, that. was the time yep. I was pounding the table. By March of last year, Berkshire had soared up to $550,000 a share, and I wrote in my investing daily the day it peaked. <laughs> I said, I hate to say it, but Berkshire is no longer a buy today. It's a hold. It's at intrinsic value. And sure enough, over the last year, Berkshire's down 10%. Uh, you know, it didn't avoid last year's drawdown yep, in yep. the market. So, um, so you know, Berkshire today, it's an incredible business, incredibly safe. I call it America's number one retirement stock. But it's so big, um, it's you have to have reasonable expectations, and you have to be clever in when to buy it. And it's up about 5.5% year-to-date versus about 75 for the S&P. So sure. a little bit of that lag you were talking about. Um, sure. Charlie Munger is kind of the crabbier of the two, a little bit bearish. Yes. You said the golden era of investing is older, is over, excuse me, if you're a value investor, you better get used to earning less. Uh, Buffett pushed back on that a little bit. But but let me ask you, what does the value investor of the future look like? In the sense that the net nets that Ben Graham looked for are not so much there anymore. I mean, there's some aren't biotech, I guess. Uh, the cigar butts, even, even 10 years ago, Warren wrote that cigar butts are gone. They used to be here. There, there's so many right. smart people. And now there's AI. Uh, what is the future and, and of value? 40,000 people showing up at this meeting exactly all, right. all drinking the Kool-Aid of value investing, looking for mispriced opportunities. I mean, look, what is value investing? It's buying dollar bills for 50 cents. It's buying good quality companies that are suffering temporary issues or something that's causing them to be underappreciated by the market. And the more investors that are out there, particularly rational ones approaching the world with that mm -hmm. approach, um, and the more supercomputers that are programmed to look for those kind of situations. That means those kind of deep inefficiencies either don't happen as often, and when they do happen, they, the stocks don't fall as much as they otherwise would have and or they rally more quickly so you don't have as much an opportunity to get in. So there's no question the investing world's gotten a lot harder. Um, I've been investing professionally for 25 years and the first 12 years were the glory days. And the last 12 years, ever since the global financial crisis and that long complacent bull market since then with a very brief period in the COVID crash, it's been tough going for traditional value investors like me. So you just have to have reasonable expectations, but be ready to pounce when uh, something like the COVID crash comes along because that that was a gift. And, yeah. and I said- It was a quick window. The, the day the market bottomed on March 23rd of 2020, mm -hmm. I wrote the headline of my daily <laughs> was, I'm trembling with greed. This is the best time to buy stocks since the global financial crisis. My colleague and I did a special video presentation mm -hmm. where we said five conservative stocks, if you want to play this conservatively, led by Berkshire. Five aggressive stocks like Spirit Airlines and TripAdvisor and Penn National Gaming mm -hmm. that are, were down 80%. And um, since then, the markets rallied hugely. The five 
traditional stocks, conservative stocks we recommended, have tracked the S&P 500, which is like up 80% or something since then. And the five aggressive stocks um, at their peak had something like tripled or quadrupled. And now they, they, last year they got sort of hammered, but they're still probably up double the market. You know? Amazing. And here well, we have some that, that guy likes your point. He, he, yes. he likes your point a lot yes. on that. And, and up 150% <laughs> the fireworks exactly, yeah. go off. We didn't have to add those effects. Yes. And, and to that point, I would even say, one thing Buffett has done well, yes, it's a bummer that the trades are so crowded, but, yeah. but I mean, a capital market is at its best when it's channeling money into good businesses and away right. from bad ones. And when you have a casino yes. or something that's all quant-based, you don't necessarily have that discriminatory function. So like, that's a positive thing. Yes, uh, and by the way, you don't have to have the whole market puke out. Right now, regional yeah. banks, if you know something about banking, and you can go in, there, there's something like a thousand publicly traded banks in the US, most of them under a wow. billion dollar market cap. And you can do fine buying Wells Fargo or JP Morgan today. I think you will outperform the market, given the whole sector is sort of out of favor, and, and it's the worst performing sector in the market this year. Um, but if you're clever and are willing to tolerate a little more risk, a little bit smaller position sizes, something like a Zions Bank Corp. Yep. yep. Um, and then there are some hundred million dollar market cap, small cap banks that are really attractive. But, but you know, that's harder you work. Be really careful. It's a little yeah. riskier. You got to size it a little smaller. You got to be willing to maybe sell them a little sooner. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, finding even all you have to do to be successful is, is to be able to find the occasional sector that falls out of uh, or even individual yep. stock that is unjustly beaten up. And you got to be brave to pounce. Yes. Uh, final question in 30 seconds, because it looks like this guy can't get enough of your points. Yes. Uh, going back to my son, he has some money saved up. He's 14. So and I'm asking everybody this. He doesn't listen so much to me now. If you were advising someone like him, uh, you know, with some money new to the market, quickest way to get started in a responsible way. Um, start by buying 20%, uh, set up a real money mm -hmm. portfolio with $5,000, let's say, mm -hmm. at TD Ameritrade yep. or E-Trade or something, Schwab, whatever. Um, put 20% in the S&P 500 mm -hmm. and then say find four other stocks and with real money, and, and I don't care if it's $1,000 and we're talking 200 in each, yep. but find four stocks and see how you do relative to the S&P, but actually go buy some real stocks. Yep. Um, and I tried to do this with my daughters years ago, mm -hmm. put $5,000 in three accounts for them, and thank goodness my default was not cash. I put nah. it all in Berkshire, and then I said, go try and beat Berkshire. And not one of them bought a single stock. Uh, <laughs> they had no interest in investing, um, even though two of them ended up being economics majors in college and have now started to show a little bit of interest, but this was, they were too young and foolish. And but I, all it um, took was one decision out of cash into Berkshire. And into Berkshire. It's so in other words, I, I closed yeah. the accounts down a few years later because yep. my, my idea failed, but <laughs> see if you can, uh, I do sadly tend to find that young boys tend to be more interested in stocks than yep. young yep. girls, which is a problem. Um, I tried to encourage it and failed. Um, but maybe you'll have greater success. But actually going out there and putting a little bit of money to work, um, I think is, um, is I think the way to start. Uh, and that's that, then you start doing research, you start reading, you recommend the great books and the Buffett letters and yep, yep. everything uh, everything from there. But putting a little bit of money to work is, is a good way to make it real. And I'll feel like I have greater success. If I mention that Whitney Tilson, the same Whitney Tilson he remembers from before, gave me this advice. So okay. I will pass it along, Whitney. Thank you so much for joining us. Always a pleasure. Right. And thanks to you guys right. for My watching pleasure. us at home.